Good evening, everyone. I'm Peter Tabak. I'm the Senior Director of Communications at the New School. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to campus and to Woolman Hall tonight. Before we begin, I have the happy assignment of thanking Louise Montello, Director of the New School's Creative Arts Therapy Program, Pam Tillis, Director of Special Events, and Seth Shapiro in the Humanities Department for stewarding, stewarding this event. Uh, everyone at the New School is also indebted to Suzanne Hanser and the Hanser and Tepperell family for bringing this conversation to our doorstep tonight. And uh, we also, as the New School, apologize for the weather. <laughs> Tonight's look at the Healing Empowerment Center designed by Sam Hanser is perhaps the ultimate New School topic, a consideration of how a carefully thought out architecture project might improve a therapeutic environment. How does design inform clinical practice? How the objectives of entirely different disciplines are strengthened when those disciplines are aligned? These questions become more interesting when we learn that the mind behind the Healing Empowerment Center was a proud alumnus of Parsons, the new school for design, with a sister about to graduate from Eugene Lang College, and that he passed away one year ago with so much left unfinished at the age of 27. Sam Hanser was also my very good friend, so it falls on me to share a few personal thoughts. Life made a promise to us, Sam said. It promised that we are meant to flourish, to blossom, and thrive. I propose these hallmarks of Sam Hanser's optimism underscore tonight's conversation. As we learn about the Healing Empowerment Center, we'll simultaneously glimpse the extraordinary vision of its creator, his buoyant estimation of life's possibilities, and his indomitable belief that we were placed here to experience grace. Before I came to the new school, I lived in San Francisco, and moving from Manhattan, I fully expected to steer clear of left coast cliches, patchouli-scented wind chimes, and spirituality. As a lifelong New Yorker, I too had a regional reputation to uphold, evidence-based, logical, and impatient particularly New Yorkers who find ourselves thousands of miles from the gravitational pull of the Hudson River. But I was not in San Francisco a month before my disregard of the spiritual world encountered a serious challenge. No one I've ever met had a perspective less familiar to mine than Sam Hanser. <laughs> a Californian by way of Brookline, Massachusetts, Sam saw his time on Earth as part of a larger project, glimpses of which he said, he understood from prior lives whole vistas of which he imagined becoming relevant in the next one. Sam's confidence overruled his diminutive stature and disheveled appearance. He sometimes batted his eyes when he spoke and he listened so intently to others it were, was as if he was entering a trance. He moved to San Francisco to work as an architect but the dream of realizing the Healing Empowerment Center led him from design to the study of somatic therapy, a practice in which the body is integrated into every treatment procedure. The very night we met, Sam told me with ecstatic embellishments that he had just quit his job and was about to enroll in the somatic therapy master's program at the California Institute of Integrative Studies. It was his life's work, he insisted, and he'd known it for hundreds of years. <laughs> In the course of our friendship, I often felt anxious when Sam and I had one-on-one -on -one time approaching, fearing that my cynicism with his talk of the spiritual world would show. I'd sigh at the wrong time or roll my eyes, somehow alienating a caring and loving friend. And time and time and time again, I found I had nothing to fear. Sam's different drum beating noisily in the background, he could diagnose my problems with ease. He shared insight into why he was studying somatic therapy, what he intended to gain 
from each retreat and workshop. And now he hoped his next opportunity on earth would be one where he'd be able to make an even bigger contribution. And time and time and time again, I found that when Sam focused, it was impossible not to feel the full force of his greater understanding. When it came time for me to consider moving back to New York to take a job at his alma mater, Sam embraced my opportunity, sharing his enthusiasm for new school students who consist solely on a diet of ideas, debate, and cigarettes. <laughs> and as he had so many times before, Sam, Sam spoke certain, with certainty without trying to change my mind. He spoke with enthusiasm without sounding like a salesman. He spoke personally while making the quiet case that even my own decision making held the seeds of something universal. In many ways I'm here tonight because of Sam's assurance that the promise life made to me would be realized. We are only here for an instant, he might say, except it's not an instant and it's not us. I'm so happy that you are all here tonight to learn more about Sam Hanser, understand some of his work, and together celebrate his spirit. Mm. Together celebrate his spirit of generosity and grace. Mm. Uh, hoping I've set the stage, I'm happy to turn the evening over to Dr. Louise Montello of the New School's Creative Arts Therapy Program. Louise. Mm -hmm. Thank you for such a heartfelt introduction to Sam Hanser's Healing Empowerment Center. Welcome everybody to our first uh, panel lecture discussion on uh, mind-body healing through the arts. And I'm really, really thrilled to present this very unique panel uh, that's looking at one of the things we've never discussed here at the New School before, which is the role of architecture in the healing process. And more than the topic is the person that has developed this particular vision and model for a healing empowerment center, Sam Hanser, who as Peter so beautifully said, was a student uh, at um, Parsons architect architecture program and uh, a healer who really integrated Eastern and Western concepts in uh, mind-body healing. And we will uh, proceed with this particular special uh, event with Sam Hanser's mother, Dr. Suzanne Hanser, who is going to present Sam's PowerPoint on the Healing Empowerment Center. And then the three of us will discuss the um, contribution and in our own, from our own unique disciplines. And then we're going to leave some time for the audience to ask questions and to respond to our discussion and the PowerPoint. So thank you very much, Dr. Hanser, for being here with us. And giving, for giving birth to <laughs> Sam himself. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for, for being here to support this vision, the Healing Empowerment Center. Um, you'll pardon me, I intend to read because I'll be reading uh, Sam's words and uh, presenting the senior thesis on the Healing Empowerment Center that uh, he did here at Parsons School of Design. Um, my first quote is the same that you shared with us, Peter, because it begins uh, his master's thesis in somatic therapy, but perhaps it bears repeating. So I'll quote from that thesis. Life made a promise to us, a promise that we would flourish, blossom, and thrive. It promised us that we could realize the next step in our evolution, that we could keep getting better, keep growing into our next highest vision, our next deepest understanding, our next fullest experience of ourselves. 
life promised that this process is limitless and that it never ends. After Sam's death a year ago, my family and I established the Samuel B. Hanser Memorial Trust to promote the vision of spiritual awareness that Sam articulated and to build the Healing Empowerment Center and perhaps many more centers across the United States and throughout the world. Sam had a dream of how people could accomplish the work that would heal mind, body, and spirit. He envisioned a place where people would be empowered to heal themselves. And he left us not only his vision, but the actual floor plan. His senior thesis, written in 2004, was the design and the underlying philosophy of the Healing Empowerment Center. It is this work that I present today. So he asked, are we curing or are we coping? It's time we recognize that the issue at hand is not one of politics or economics, but spirituality. It is time we realize that it's not external force, but internal source that gives rise to the lasting change that we direly seek. It is time that we owned our beliefs that the world is at the cause in our experience of it. So, where current healthcare models break down, doctors are granted exclusive authority over our well being in a manner that recalls priestly status. With my apologies to the physicians and medical professionals in the audience, Brian, sorry. <laughs> um, Diagnosis is a label that often gets mistaken for practical understanding and does not mean that doctors know how to treat the diagnoses they offer. Drug therapies are used more often as coping mechanisms than curative measures. Consumers end up trading one set of symptoms for another as a result of side effects and may require such medications for life. Disconnection between treatment modalities that address different levels of our being, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, often prevent a comprehensive understanding of the dis-ease presented, and thus never get to the heart of the matter. Disempowerment is the result of forgetting that we have everything we will ever need within us. How can we create a new healthcare model? Claim the healer that is in each of us and make choices about our well-being from the care and concern of that healer. Healing is not an ability reserved for the educated elite or specially gifted, but rather an innate capacity available to us all. Focus on treating the whole person rather than the disease itself. Go within rather than without to find resolution for disease. Instruments, drugs, or any accoutrements outside of ourselves are decorations of illusion that take our power from us. None of them are needed in the experience of healing. Seek to honor all parts of our being on all levels and open up that which we are a part of as well. Acknowledge that the experience of the disease and the one who experiences disease are united and not disparate entities. Understand disease without judgment, not as a punishment or failing, but simply as a signal of imbalance in the human energy system. Take complete responsibility for the ways we create our lives and transcend victimhood in our consciousness. The Healing Empowerment Center is a metaphysical clinic founded on a true synthesis of Eastern and Western wisdom. It will utilize a dynamic model of integrated holistic therapies based on power and responsibility from within to build consciousness and create people's lives anew. The guiding principle is a belief that we already have within us the wisdom and power to lead happy and healthy lives. The role of the healthcare worker becomes that of a facilitator, 
holding a safe space for wounds and shadows to be faced, teaching skills and tools for clients to reclaim the healer within, and offering a multi-layered support system for the process of transformation to take place. There is nothing offered in the Healing Empowerment Center that clients can't then take home and do for themselves. Indeed, a successful Healing Empowerment Center will transform all of its clients into their own centers of healing and empowerment. To provide resources, education, direct service, and support to those who wish to reclaim their power. That is the mission of the Healing Empowerment Center, to support clients in taking back their ability to heal themselves and the world in which they live through drawing upon power and responsibility from within. That is the mission of the Healing Empowerment Center to create a cosmically responsible community of humans worldwide who will cooperatively share responsibility to shoulder stewardship of the earth. Yoga, psychotherapy, and energy-based work comprise the three arms of this wellness world. Together, they have the capacity to embrace humans on all levels of their being, including their physical, emotional, mental and spiritual bodies. The power of this model lies in its ability to handle both our egoic and spiritual, that is personal and transpersonal, levels of being. While the foundations of these models lie in spiritual truth, they are nonetheless equipped to support our personality's struggles in a very challenging four-dimensional world. And here is the home team a typical client program with yoga psychotherapy and energy-based work comprising the three arms of this wellness model. The inspirations for the physical design include Stonehenge, a prehistoric, mysterious circle of upright stones in southern England that began some 5,000 years ago the stones are aligned almost perfectly with the sunrise on the summer solstice, and it is almost unquestioned that Stonehenge was built as a spectacular place of worship. Inspirations, solar alignment, pure geometry, monumental scale, use of light and shadow to express time and a relationship to the cosmos, sacred ground. The Parthenon a temple for all pagan gods. Inspirations, the central oculus, solar alignment, pure geometry, light and shadow used to represent time and a relationship to the cosmos, religious temple. The great stupa at Shanxi. The Shanxi stupa also dates back thousands of years its construction was begun in the 3rd century BC. Sanchi continues to grow as a site of religious zeal. Inspirations, pure geometry, symmetry, circumambulation, solar alignment, the great round reliquy. At the center of the building is a hole that serves as the main focus for the building's concept, meditation. The central focus must be empty so as not to limit the boundless miracles that arise out of the metaphoric void, out of the mystery, out of our unknowing. The center then becomes a womb from which awareness springs. The entire building's organization is designed in relationship to that central focus. Organizing the building around a single focus point creates a center of gravity that draws energy to it. Because all circulation is really circumambulation around this core, the simple act of walking through the building becomes a meditation itself. In this way, the practice of the building becomes an escapable constant, a mantra, as it were, as well as a map 
for the direction of energy to flow within those who place their focus at the center. A client's movement through the building will complement the intensity of the work they are doing. Each concentric floor moves outward and upward with public activities happening on the lower two floors and one-on-one -on -one client therapies happening on the third and fourth floor. The top floor is reserved for the practitioners and administrators of the center, honoring their work with the best views the building has to offer. The result of any meditation practice is an increased capacity for reception. More reception allows us to have both greater awareness and easier access to the joy and well-being that is our very nature. The building's formal mimicry of the ancient Greek amphitheater is a reference for our own contemplative experience. In some ways, it acts as a vortex, drawing in energy for the benefit of those who inhabit the building. I'll read from the program notes. Emergence. The overriding theme of the Healing Empowerment Center's design is emergence through the language of form, space, light, and materials. The architecture and interior design shall evoke the experience of a journey of awakening. Thus, the building will be an allegory for the growth of its users. Supporting this concept are five concomitant directives. Monumentality the building as an object that stands against the Manhattan skyline. Transparency, exploitation of natural light, surrounding views, and clarity of design intent. Response to national, natural geography, acknowledgement of river and parks through landscaping and architectural features. Haven, interior spaces for client work must support an emotional feeling of security, safety, and calm repose. Togetherness. Public interior spaces must embrace its community, aligning and connecting their hearts and minds together. The theoretical site is on the west side of Lower Manhattan at the edge of land and water, civilization, and nature. The site is currently a sanitation building at the Hudson River Pier by the West Village. The sanitation building's floor plate, with an opportunity to add a second or third level, is large enough to encompass the institutional scale of the Healing Empowerment Center. Its surroundings of the river and the West Side Highway Parks Project also offer it as an engaging, area with natural elements, perfect for integration with its healing garden. Landscaping, a connection with the parks, and the entrance will most likely fulfill this programmatic need. The fact that the site is on the edge of Manhattan allows it to feel apart from the daily hubbub, but not so far away that one has to travel to New Jersey. <laughs> More importantly, the sanitation building's location provides an opportunity to create a monumental feature on New York's skyline. The vista from this spot looks out at New Jersey, the Hudson River, and Manhattan, and only accentuates the grandeur of quiet witness so integral to the center's inward practice. To reinforce the strict use of pure geometry and strong axes of symmetry, the site's landscaping unfolds in the French garden style. The design of recreational parks as part of the site plan allows the building to tie itself naturally into the developing Hudson River projects. Platforms and windows direct attention to the densest and most active focal points along the city skyline. 
And as you can see, even the sectional uh, view here uh, resembles some of the yoga postures. The floor plants show meditation, body work, and uh, larger Hatha Yoga studios on the ground floor. On the second floor, a greenhouse and gardening area. Sam said, tending to the garden often requires getting rid of the weeds. It means adding fertilizer, and it means patiently, tenderly coaxing the seeds in their growth. You see the smaller client rooms here and the roof of the, guard, the garden greenhouse and bodywork classroom. On the fourth floor, uh, smaller rooms for client work, support groups. And the fifth floor for the administration overseeing the work. On approach, the building's round form functions to close off the hectic traffic of the city. The main entrance is aligned on a central axis, bringing people from the French Garden outside into the main focus of the central opening. Upon entry, the building opens into a monumental courtyard offering exterior space that feels contained and secure. At the other end of this connection, there is also a presence that is bigger than us, something greater than us. One could call it life, one could call it God, one could call it love. But no matter the name, that presence is longing to fulfill its promise to help us grow, thrive, and realize our own personal potential. In my orientation with clients, I'm also reaching for that greater presence in the room with them. And so therapy for me is a dance supporting life, giving life to itself. I believe that the soul reaches for God through a body and that God reaches back through grace. My work as a therapist is about fulfilling life's promise. Warm tones are used on the interior while concrete outside matches the city's cooler feel. The saffron orange of Buddhist monks' robes is used to carpet all public circulation corridors. I don't think Sam took into account all of the uh, cleaning costs that would be involved. <laughs> this reinforces the reference of one of the building's inspirations, the great stupa of Sanchi, <laughs> where circumambulation around the mound is a form of spiritual practice. You can imagine doing yoga, looking out at the water. Sam said, yoga is a path to oneness. We were all on this path, although we each may take a different route. Indeed, there are thousands of official yogas. For the sake of this wellness model, I have included some of the most fundamental aspects common to most of them. Asana, pranayama, mantra, and japa. All exposure to sunlight on the first and second floors comes only from the inner courtyard. On the third and fourth floors, where the client rooms are, practitioners use this time to help turn a client's focus from inward to outward. In these rooms, sliding glass doors open into balconies beyond, thus offering an objective metaphor for the subjective work being done there. With a building, it's hard to feel free and possible inside it without open space, good air quality, and access to natural light. The same principle of structure-function relationship applies equally to the body. It's hard to feel free and possible inside a body without relaxed muscles, easy breathing, and a balanced system. 
Meditation is the core practice within the Healing Empowerment Center. Meditation is the act of moving through the building. Meditation is the direction in which the building points by offering a focus that draws its contemplators inward. In this way, meditation serves as the concept, the practice, and the spirit of the Healing Empowerment Center. Through the avenues of patience and compassion, lit by grace and tended by love's agents, the path awaits. And deep within you, primordial memories stir. They simmer in the recesses of your consciousness, ready to be boiled by your spiritual evolution. Waste not the precious opportunity of your human casing, for it will teach you the responsibility and integrity necessary for cosmic citizenship. The force that turns an acorn into an oak I call grace. It's the most natural, organic process. For humans, though, it's a little more complicated. We have a mind and emotions that can often keep us from being in contact with this state of grace. Pain, fear, despair, all make it hard to accept what's happening. But the very act of turning towards our experience and becoming present within our own bodies has the power to summon this grace. In other words, every time we show up fully and completely in ourselves, life fulfills its promise to us. And that is what therapy is about for me, engaging the dance between presence and grace so that life can fulfill its promise both through us and with us. And that's the story of the Healing Empowerment Center. May we see it built. pleased to have a respondent to the PowerPoint of, of Sam Hanser, and it's a Clark Pickett, who is an architect with um, NBBJ here in New York, originally from Seattle, and he uh, actually knew Sam. Sam worked at the, uh, the NBBJ in Seattle uh, years ago, and um, Clark is is going to share with us his, his ideas, his insights, his uh, ex expertise around this particular project. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. I actually found out about coming here just uh, yesterday. There was another person that actually knew Sam uh, better than I did who actually, actually worked with Sam on this project in, uh, in Seattle. He t interned uh, with our office. but. Um, I, I knew Sam, and he had an enormous amount of energy. Um, and he really, when he put his mind to something, and he really put it full force into it. And what I like about this project and the way you describe it is, is that, um, and I think what's important to think about is design is not uh, something that's stagnant. It's something that happens uh, through time, three-dimensionally through time. We experience design. Um, as we walk through a space. We don't experience it as a picture in, a, in an architecture magazine. And so what I like about his approach here was that he, he stepped back and said, what are the, not only the elements of here, you know, the transparency, the monumentality, the natural light, um, natural light, et cetera. But he really described it as a process, that you're actually experiencing this design through a process. And I think that's how I like to approach design. Um, and I do quite a bit of work in healthcare. So, and we really do discuss things about how is it that, for instance, if someone is sick or a patient, how is it that they actually experience a building? How is it they're brought in? What do they see? What is it that they're feeling? And what's amazing about this is he really did jump into that sense of the approach, the process, and thinking about it through time, design through time. Mm -hmm. I'll speak a little bit about uh, Sam's Empowerment Center through my own experience with Sam. I met Sam when he was 14, and he uh, was seeking. Uh, at that age, he was very, very much uh, ahead of his time. He really 
uh, was deeply spiritual and wanting uh, to make a difference in the world. And I gave him a book uh, called Freedom from the Bondage of Karma. And um, he just took that to heart and probably finished his karma by the time he was 28 <laughs> and, uh, and left us with, with his life's work, uh, the Healing Empowerment Center. And uh, I think the thing that, that moves me the most, uh, looking at the PowerPoint again, is um, the idea of illness as opportunity and not as something to try to eradicate, you know, and get somebody else to, to get rid of it for you, but to see it as a way of, as in his words, emergence, awakening to a deeper level of consciousness. And uh, what better system of using that uh, awakening uh, than, than the yoga? system. It's been around for thousands of years and in yoga illness is just one step of, on, on the path of life and it's not something that we need to run away from. It's something that is a teacher to us and to have a center where everyone is committed to helping the aspirant, the quote, sick person, to really confront that particular step in the stage of transformation, the stage of life, to me is, is truly the vision. It's, it's, it's why we're here, all of us that are health professionals, all of us who are on our own spiritual paths, is to, to really open up to the fact that we're all going to get sick at some point in our lives, and we've all, we've all been sick, and maybe we've been running away from our sickness instead of stopping for a moment, taking a breath, and, and saying, hey, you know, what is this illness going to teach me? How can I transform through this illness? How can I reach out to people who are on the same wavelength of wanting to help me to transform? and to find meaning in this illness, and to perhaps even um, become a, a leader in, or a healer in helping others through this illness. And as we all know, how many of you in this room have, are health professionals or are, are healers? How many of you have discovered that healing power through your own illness? I'm just curious. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so I think that Sam was, was really ahead of his time in, in recognizing that at a very young age. And he did struggle with his own illnesses as well and committed to almost every kind of healing modality that I know of uh, over the very short period of his life. Uh, so he truly was uh, someone who experienced this. So the center is his own life, um, his own learning and growth and in emergence and awakening through illness uh, into this, um, this gift of, uh, for us, for humanity, to also have the same experience that he had in his in very short life here on, on the planet. So um, I... I I'm very thrilled to, um, to be sharing this. And you're one of the first groups that um, are part of this unfolding vision. And again, this isn't new. I mean, this, this idea of transforming through illness has been around uh, here in New York. Susan, uh, gosh, I just forgot her name. S Susan Sondag? Um, and, and, you know, of course, the Eastern um, gurus have come here and have spoken about this since the 60s and 70s. Um, but I do think that it's a critical time now for us to really make this happen because um, 
there are so many illnesses that don't have to be so prevalent, particularly the stress-related illnesses, that yoga and other mind-body um, systems really address in terms of preventing them and transforming them when we do uh, develop diseases like heart disease or cancer or other autoimmune diseases which are becoming more and more prevalent these days. And there, there really needs to be um, centers like this around the world that are points of light for people who are confused, lost, lonely, uh, stressed out. Uh, and, and I definitely want to be a part of that vision. So thank you for listening. I have a question for, um, for you. Um, because, of course, we hope to see this Healing Empowerment Center built. And yet, um, both of you have seen the history of, of healthcare emerge from your different perspectives. Clark, from your experience in, in actually designing and building new healthcare centers. And Louise, from your vast experience in looking at Eastern and Western medicine and the integration, um, along with other aspects of the environment, creative arts. Um, where, where are we in the evolution of a sort of healing empowerment center, both structurally and philo philosophically? Well, we're farther than we were 10 years ago. We're not as far as we should be. Um, I think what's interesting about this project is very provocative in the sense that it's, it's really forcing us to look at the question of integration. Um, healthcare has, even um, unlike many other professions, has had a, a trouble integrating uh, non-traditional thinking into uh, its practice. It's been a history of that, and part of it's because most healthcare organizations are very large, they're very bureaucratic, uh, there's a lot of old school thinking, so to speak. Um, but there, is, there are changes, and they're changing the changes that are happening, frankly, coming from the consumer. The patient. That's where it's really coming from. I mentioned to these guys earlier that, um, um, at least from a design perspective, uh, integrating much more thinking about bringing better design into hospitals really started with birthing centers because mothers could choose where they had their babies. And of course, uh, a mother's going to choose a room that's nicely designed, has the spa bathtub, has the connection to natural light, has the the energy that I think even, and that Sam is even speaking of here. So it started in those centers because it became a market opportunity for hospitals to actually get more mothers into their, their hospitals. So I think that it has to come from that. It has to come from the consumer as a piece of this. It's starting to make its way. Um, we're seeing it making its way into the general hospital design. Uh, you see it, the stuff moving into regular patient rooms, you're seeing into clinics, you're seeing uh, a lot of things that are happening in pediatrics. Pediatrics, uh, hospital design is actually pushing the limits of really thinking much more mind-body, more holistically uh, about the patient. So that's at least what I'm seeing. But I think we, what's provocative about this is we've still got actually a long ways to go. Okay, <laughs> got a lot of work to do. So, from my perspective, I, and this really ties into the Mind Body Healing Through the Arts lecture series and the Creative Arts Therapy program here at the New School. We, as creative arts therapists, have always put empowerment first in working with our clients. We believe that there is a healer within that can be accessed through the arts. And um, we have been integrated into hospitals here in this country and around the world, I would say since World War II uh, was over, um, with the vet veterans coming home from, from the war and, and really not being able to heal with traditional healing methods. And so that's where artists stepped in and started to play music for patients and get them to draw and get them to move creatively and accessing that healing essence that is within. And doctors and, and other kinds of health professionals were just amazed. They're like, well, gosh, the drugs don't work, but the music does. And uh, you know, the, the color in a piece of artwork has, has transformed the illness of, of someone that was thought to just 
have to live for the rest of their lives in a back ward. So this is something that I'm, I'm really thrilled about because not only uh, do we find creative arts therapists in healthcare all over the world now, but there's also evidence that the work that we're doing is having an impact uh, from a scientific perspective which is, is really, you were talking about integration, and that's really what it's all about right now, is bringing light into the darker areas of healthcare, and, and doing that in ways that's non-threatening. You know, we don't want to come in and say, you're wrong and we're right, uh, because that is something that, that never works. And so um, any of you that are wanting to learn more about creative arts therapy, you're in the right place here at this <laughs> lecture series. Each week we're going to have another practitioner coming and talking about how they're using the arts in different healthcare settings and in education as well uh, to make a difference in this feeling of you know, uh, the victimization in, in the uh, in the healthcare uh, environment, you know, that I'm sick and somebody else has to save me versus I'm sick and I have unlimited resources within to heal myself. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would add to that that one model that is taking shape um, uh, in the healthcare industry is this idea of participation by the patient as part of the team, the health team that the patient's no longer sort of the center of and um, basically analogous to the disease that that, that uh, patient has, that there's a team surrounding it, that really the patient's now part of the team. The patient and family become part of an overall team that includes research, that includes doctors, nurses, and it should include some of these other modalities uh, that really help a holistic view of, of healing the patient, that the disease is really the focus, not the patient as the disease. Mm -hmm. Could you both say a little more about the effect of the environment on health and on healing? Okay, the environment. Uh, you're talking about New York right now, no. today. Oh, I think it's been a really rough day for a lot of us. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously the quality of the air, the quality of the water, the quality of the mind, I mean, from a yoga perspective, all illness emanates from the mind, from thoughts. And negativity is a, uh, a major cause of weakening of the physical body. And scientifically, you know, what we're seeing is, the is, is negative thoughts activate the fight or flight reaction in, in the nervous system which then releases stress hormones, which uh, if they build up over long periods of time, can lead to chronic illness. And as some of you in the audience uh, know, who work in chronic illness uh, hospitals, um, the, the numbers of people with chronic illness, it's not going down, you know, with, with all of the, uh, I guess, information that we have now about taking care of ourselves, people are still getting sick. So we really do, I think Sam was brilliant in that, we really do have to work at the level of the mind. We have to teach people how to become the observers of their minds and to make a choice. What kind of mental environment do you want to live in, in your life? Do you want to live in a mind that is dirty? <laughs> and polluted with negative thoughts and expectations and feelings? Or do you want to use this prefrontal cortex, this uh, discriminating factor or force within the mind to start to weed out, as Sam was saying, pull out the weeds in the mind that create negativity that can lead to illness? So I, I think the yoga model is perfect for that. And, and we're really seeing a lot of research now around the area of mindfulness in medicine, in education, in, um, in the workplace. And of course, it, I think it started in, 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 in athletics, 
you know, athletes were realizing that, wow, I can use visualization mm -hmm. to help me to maximize my potential. You know, so we all need to learn these techniques and to be encouraged to use them on a regular basis. And honestly, there will not be any kind of, um, well, there, there won't be the massive amounts of, of chronic illness, I think, when we develop the mind in that way. There'll be illnesses that are part of karma. Excuse my word, the word. We're at the new school. I can use that word here quite easily. But they're, thing, they're lessons. Our illnesses will, will just be lessons, and we'll be guided through them in a way that uh, will increase more joy in our lives. From a design perspective, there's a lot of things going in on. There's um, just from an environmental standpoint, um, the really the building industry really moving in the direction of environmental responsibility and stewardship through I don't know if you guys know about lead programs that kind of things and hospitals developing green guidelines for healthcare. There really has been a push to um, step back and say, are we designing a building that's actually unhealthy for the people who are in it, and how do we put different materials not only build responsible materials that come from systems that aren't polluting the environment, but also are these materials we're using putting on gases that are unhealthy for those people who are, are in the facility. So I think there has been a lot of movement in the last decade in that direction. Um, from the more sort of psychological and emotional side of this, there's a lot of studies going on uh, around color and what happens with interior design. Probably the most profound is, and you probably would guess this, is the effect of natural light and the, the way that natural light has an effect on healing. And uh, I'm finding in all my work is that we, uh, whether it's actually health healthcare, workplace, or whatever, is that access to natural light, we're really revisiting that in a way that uh, we hadn't in, you know, since uh, mechanical systems and electrical systems allowed us to make very, very large floor plates in buildings and not to, to bring natural light into the deeper recesses of that. So we are seeing natural light as being one of the major factors in actually contributing to uh, how we're designing for healing environments. It, it's so beautiful to, to hear you speak um, and to feel like we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about light, and yeah. it's it's really the yeah. same exact place metaphorically that, <laughs> that that we're coming from. And I think we need these kinds of dialogues within healthcare, within creative arts therapy, within architecture, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's really the next wave of uh, developing new models, new paradigms, if you will, for healing and, and health, and, and, and including the environment. And, and I, I'm just thrilled that, that this is happening here at the New School, and, and that you know, we'd, we'd like um, more more experiences like this, where we are dialoguing with people that we usually don't talk to, right? What would be some other people that we could include in this kind of a dialogue, Suzanne? Because I know you're very much emerge, immersed in uh, working in Boston in many different healthcare settings, uh, using music therapy mm -hmm. as a modality for healing. Well, I think that the um the medical model is um, pervasive in um, certainly in, in healthcare, but also perhaps in other aspects of of our um, of our lives and of our communities. That um, physicians um, uh, are called upon for answers uh, and for ways to fix problems and for for their wisdom, and of course. Um, Yes, you physicians are, are wise and have gone on to many, many hours and years of training. Um, but there are other things that, that affect health, and I think that um, we need to begin to talk with those people that are making healthcare decisions, um, and not just physicians, but the politicians and economists that, that Sam said we need to put aside and remember that, that we need to approach our health from perhaps a spiritual point of view 
but um, spirituality and physical health have often not come together. Um, it's a different vocabulary. Uh, it's a different language that, that we use, a very different perspective. And so it's very hard to dialogue, very hard to communicate, and I think even harder to make change. Um, so in, until we can consider ourselves on perhaps an equal playing field where we each have something to contribute, um, I think it, it's very hard to move to this new paradigm that you're speaking of. Yeah, and I think what's provocative about this project is that it's asking us to look at that integration model. And actually, if I have one criticism of this project is that it, it actually in some ways is doing, in some ways it's not integrating enough. It's not taking mm -hmm. into account that, it's really taking into account that these are people who are generally well, ambulatory, can move. Mm. What about sicker people? How are we incorporating sicker people into yes. this model? Are we bringing doctors, not just nurses, into right. this? Um, and so you, you can almost see that there's, there's still the two sides are mm -hmm. too separated. So if the integration really is to happen, it needs to even be more so than mm -hmm. either the current healthcare model is or even the, yes. uh, this, this particular yes. example. Thank you for saying that, yeah. I'm curious about, about your thoughts Thank from you. an, an educational perspective. I, I was so hoping that that would not happen. <laughs> uh, my, my, I, I think I'm sitting here aware of the fact that Sam did say, you know, to keep politicians on the side when in this country we are, we either are or are about not to have massive change in the way health is delivered in the United States. Um, I don't know where that plays into this. I'm very, very, as a, you know, it, cynicism does not survive this comprehensive of view. And this is the first time I've seen Sam's work in the detail that Suzanne brought to us. So I'm sort of surprised. Um, you know, I, I would like to imagine a world in which a, a vision which I see up there is more communitarian is the sort of thing that the Americans, that policymakers even, and the folks who eventually have to pay for healthcare change would embrace. I don't know if that's very likely right now when the smallest detail of that plan seems to incite rage. Um, I don't see myself as an educator, uh, so I can't answer Louise's great question. I, I am, I'm, you know, I, I see this very much as the kind of conversation we have at the new school, but then I'm always saying things like that. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was just happy to be able to remember Sam the way that I think that he would want us to be seeing him, which is to be having this conversation and looking at his work. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I would love to talk more about <laughs> this topic because I think it needs to be talked about. Is there a bridge for anybody here on the panel between the uh, more conservative uh, medical model people and the spiritual people? Is there a way? of building that bridge. It does the bridge, I know the bridge exists. I see my colleagues sitting in the audience building those bridges. So I know it exists and hopefully when we get to the uh, audience sharing, you'll talk about what, you, what you're doing. But uh, maybe you can address that. Well, I'll, I'll just mention um, the world of integrated medicine, which is uh, one where uh, at least Eastern practices and ancient practices are being integrated into traditional Western medicine. Whereas um, individuals who were not able to be cured or treated effectively uh, with traditional Western medicine were looking for um, other treatments in different countries, um, practitioners who didn't have credentials because they made promises of some sort of cure with some very unusual treatment. Um, currently, we've moved from alternative medicine to complementary medicine, where some physicians are looking at um, Eastern practices like acupuncture, massage therapy, and uh, herbs, Chinese herbs, and qigong as something very foreign and not quite um, able to be understood in the vocabulary of Western medicine with its clinical trials and its randomized controls and what have you, because we're talking about systems of 
energy in the, uh, in the body and surrounding the body that may not be as amenable to measurement as, um, as other factors. And so um, to integrate um, medicine is something that is um, challenging to do, and yet there are now um, centers for, uh, in fact, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine is funding research. Um, there are uh, organizations like the Society for Integrative Oncology looking at how to integrate treatments like acupuncture, music therapy, creative arts therapy, nutritional counseling into um, traditional chemotherapy and radiation. And uh, so at least we're beginning to work together because the evidence is becoming um, much more um, evident <laughs> uh, that um, we're all looking to the evidence base behind some of these treatments that have not really had the opportunity for researchers to take a serious look at them. Certainly the funding is not available to, uh, or has not been available before something like this NCAM came about to look at acupuncture and what it's effective at and what it's not effective at. And similarly for music therapy and these other uh, fields that are perhaps non-traditional. So I think that we are um, beginning to see in integrative medicine and in um, the sorts of collaborations that many of my colleagues who are in the audience are, are doing, music and medicine and music and neurology, um, and I'm sure many others of you are beginning to, um, to open up. Uh, I think that we are making some, some progress in beginning to speak the same language. Thank you. I am getting a, uh, <laughs> I'm getting a sign from Sam. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> that I share this with you. I, I wrote a note here as I was looking at the video, at the uh, PowerPoint. The slide that you showed with the circular, well, just the many slides with the circular construction. Our mothers and our fathers. Uh, the first three years of our lives set the stage for a, a feeling of safety. Is the universe a safe place? Literally becomes hardwired in our body minds during those three years. And I, this is something that Sam and I talked about, and it, it's, I'm, I get a little shaky talking, hmm. talking about it because I think that it's so much of what led him to exploring bodywork because when there are issues that are unresolved in those first few years of our lives, they often are, there are there, they become embodied in the physical body without any ability of the mind or even the emotions to make sense out of it because we don't have the ego development to be able to understand what's going on. So for example, if a child felt abandoned during the first you know, few years of their lives or if they were traumatized or they uh, lost something that was very dear to them, that can create this sense of not being safe of not being able to trust that I will get my needs met. And that creates a very shaky foundation <coughs> that can predispose a person later in life towards taking risky behaviors, for example, or uh, perhaps repressing emotions and not even knowing they're repressing them. One of the words that describes that is dissociation. Mm. That I have feelings, but they are on the back burner. And as Einstein says, feelings are energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So where do those feelings go? They're alive somewhere in the physical body. And they're acting on the physical body, sometimes in the form of autoimmune diseases and other kinds of self-destructive behaviors alcoholism and, and other 
uh, you know, addictive behaviors can be related to this very early experience of attachment or unhealthy attachment. So this is something that I, th I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of in, obviously, in psychology and also how that relates to physical health. There's a wonderful researcher, um, I don't forgot his, la his first name, but it's Wick Wickramasakera, who has done research on people with autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. that are very difficult to treat. And he's found that in a very, very large population of, of subjects, that every single person that was in his study had experienced childhood trauma or abuse. Uh, so there is some connection between our very early experiences that perhaps weren't able to be processed um, verbally and later kinds of, of illnesses and, and uh, risky behaviors. So it's something that I think we need to be on the alert for in our own lives, in, uh, in our children, in education, in, um, in, in health care. Uh, and the arts are a way of getting to those unspoken words and memories. And the healing can be quite profound if we're allowed to um, integrate our work into um, healthcare settings, into education. Uh, it's one of my, my uh, missions right now is to work with teachers and, and teaching them how to understand the needs of their children based on psychological developmental models and to understand the signs and symptoms of abuse and trauma in their children's lives and to find ways of, co of correcting that before these kids grow up and become self-destructive and or develop illnesses that could be traced back to those kinds of traumas. So I think, Sam, I'm just feeling that I was not going to talk about this at all, but somehow the, the PowerPoint has really um, opened me up to wanting, wanting to share this with the public. So, um, so thank you for listening to that. I think it might be time to um, open up the uh, panel to questions or comments from you in the audience. We'd love to hear from you if you, um, yes. Um, so I just, I was wondering what you think about the integration as it exists as far as prevention <laughs> okay. Um, uh, wow. I, 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 again, I think creative arts therapy is on the cutting edge right now because what we're saying to everybody is express yourself, you know, share your vision, share your beauty, share your pain, share you. Uh, as best you can through the creative process. And to me, uh, that is one of the most important ways of preventing negative thoughts, negative feelings, negative physical states. Um, Do you find that you need to speak a different language also to get your point across? Because you speak very much from kind of a loving, spiritualized point of view. You speak very much from an architectural, you know, business-minded <laughs> point of view. So it's, it's very interesting to have this discussion and, and see, just even in the language that you both present, mm -hmm. the differences. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was a research scientist at NYU for 15 years, and that is not my strong suit. <laughs> uh, but I, I forced myself to do that work so that I could speak the language of the uh, people that I admire and, and want to work with. So I think it's important for us to, to, uh, to strengthen our weaker functions. And, and that's something that um, will create those bridges, mm -hmm. for sure. I would say, uh, speaking of the bridges, I think a lot of this is an educational uh, 
uh, comes from education, uh, the ability of people to really sit and talk and listen to each other. And you mentioned a conversation, I guess you knew, Sam, that that, that dialogue that you just described says to me that already there's understanding of where those bridges can be met. And that comes through us talking to each other and really educating each other from the different sides that we come from. I really appreciate hearing another perspective on, on Sam. Thank you for that. And, and also for, for speaking of prevention, prevention is a pretty safe word because we can talk about prevention of illness. And so we're purely within the, the medical model. But everyone's for prevention. We want to prevent bad things from happening whether it's accidents or illnesses or other conditions. Um, and so, um, so prevention may be um, the landscape for some conversation. Um, it's very difficult with research to look at prevention because, of course, prevention means that something is not going to happen. So it's very difficult to... Uh, to do scientific research that will show I've prevented you from becoming ill. Um, and so there are some roadblocks there, but I think um, it's a very good way to, to start the conversations, as you say. Um, how do we incentivize, incentivize people who otherwise wouldn't want to do that hard work to say this is... This is well, I think, I mean, I'm maybe speaking out of turn here, but it's really about the, until the pill stops working. I mean, you, yes. you, there was a mention that uh, um, that we we do these modalities when until the diagnosis, but we also do them when nothing else is working too. When we go through all the cycles of the medical system, and we go, oh well, that's not working either. So we end up coming back. So there's this sort of circle that happens anyway. Um, so. I, I actually agree with you. It's a very difficult thing. I mean, one of the projects I'm working on, I'm actually doing a project for NYU at the moment, uh, uh, a new hospital for them, and our whole focus is how to educate um, and bring in the patient as part of this process so they understand their own illness and they are part of that team to cure that person. It's not about a pill anymore. It's not about a specific treatment. It's about that patient having active participation in their own health. And that is a hard thing to do, I agree with you. But I think that as people are getting sicker and, and, and you know, people are not getting well, is that they're gonna look to it at that point. I think they, you know, I don't really have an answer. I think that's a really tough one. But our focus, I know, with what we're trying to do is that the new healthcare model is about making the patient an educated patient, making decisions for themselves about their health, which means they've got to understand that they are part of the team to cure, to heal themselves. Thank you for that question. That really is the question. How do we get people to stop? You know, I, I taught a class last night here in, in music therapy, and I, I gave my class one assignment to find a piece of music and relax to it for 20 minutes. Well. The responses I got from my students, young people, saying, well, I laid down and I turned the music on and I, I had a panic attack. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't relax. I, I couldn't stop thinking. I, I, just, I had so many things I had to get done and I had to get, you know, address my Facebook group and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And, 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 and you're telling me I have to relax. And, and this was half the class. And I, I was, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, so for me, I, I, we forget how hard it is for most people just to stop and to look within and, and feel, you know, why are we so afraid? Mm. It's a good question. Yes. I'm just wondering if anyone could comment on uh, Sam's ideas within the context of uh, of coping with uh, death and dying. Hmm. Would you hand me the book? Oh, the book. Sam's book. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, I will, I will quote from Sam. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Death. Learn to die, for they who know how to die shall truly know how to live. Death may be the greatest, happiest moment of your life. 
It is the awakening from your dream, your return home. Ironically, birth is a far more traumatic experience than death. It makes your arrival into the relative, into an illusory separation. Be assured that there are many beings who assist you in these transitions. At no point in your experience are you ever alone. In truth, there are no deaths, only transformations of consciousness. Embrace these transitions, befriend them, because on their arrival, you will have no choice but to face yourself. Do you like what you see? Fear not, my beloved. Each death is but an opportunity to create yourself anew. Is that a good enough answer for you? <laughs> and, and from a yoga perspective, just exhaling is an opportunity to face our death. You know, we're letting go and, and to get comfortable with that exhalation is is the practice. It's okay. It's okay to let go. And when you die, that's that's all there is, is that exhalation. You know. Joanne. Um, architecture is a huge part of it, and so is sound and design. So I hear wellness, and I see a very um, attractive idea here. We're actually looking at um, some of the projects we look at are even um, not so much specifically he healthcare, but uh, we do quite a bit of hospitality as well as what are the other senses too? Not just what you see and what you hear, but what is it you smell? How do those affect it as well? So really looking at all the senses and saying, what are those? What, what combination of those senses actually help in the healing process? Mm. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lowy. And um, I hope that those of you that are excited about this will uh, sign up uh, on the mailing list and uh, will join up with, with Suzanne and, and with, with us in, in making this a reality. You, know, you will have an, in, an input. You will have the power to make this happen. <laughs> You had your hand up, yes. Yeah. The one thing that I would have to say about the design is that of, 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 of the way it felt a bit exclusive. That was my only um, kind of feedback that it had, um, and how to, how do you take that lack of shame and, and lack of categorization and allow people, because there's a lot of things being said around the, how, how, do, you, how do you make certain personal changes so that we stop putting we stop just taking the pill, but how to, how to make the conversation less exclusive. I think that's extraordinarily apt, and it, it's part of why I, you know, I, I who approach so much, so much, frankly, of what's been talked about tonight, very much as an outsider, but you know, when confronted with Sam's capacity, but both to explain it in a way that you know, a Yahoo like myself would be able to pick it up, but also to make no apologies for it, and to not in any way even acknowledge that someone might, might you know, look sarc sarcastically or, 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 or stereotypically at, oh, of course, you know, it's a spiritual idea and we're all, gonna, we're all gonna hold hands and turn to limit. He didn't have any of that. And so I couldn't hold on to it while talking to him. Right. And, I, and I, I, I particularly like the way you put it when you say he lacked shame. And it's, and it, that, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, because I think that the, the question is, is now how do you start a conversation where someone can allow themselves to be ill and allow themselves right. to be sick without there being another kind of circle of people or there is a way, and I've had it happen to me when I've gone to a doctor for any, any numerous amount of large or big things where you feel like, wait a minute, I didn't come here to be judged. I came here actually to get some answers. And what I'm feeling, I'm feeling closed in, I'm feeling closer to being, I'm feeling sicker. If that, if that, if you know, if after I leave this place, <laughs> then, then I did when I walked in, you know. Um, so, you know, I just, you know, I just, I just wanted to share that about, you know, who he was and who, what, what, who he was to me and my relationship to this project, which I think is just unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah. I think visionaries are kind of shame, 
shameless. <laughs> they just don't. actually I actually liked your comment about the uh, there is a, a bit of exclusivity uh, within that, and and some of it has to do with that formal garden entrance, and I, we won't get into a design <laughs> discussion here, but <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> um, and so there are I think. You know, bringing what you bring to this, I mean, as the evolution of design moves on, I think that kind of input is fantastic because, to me, that's the kind of thing as a designer, if, it were, if I were the architect on that, I would take that and say, it, this is what Sam's about, let's design to what that is. And there are things you can do. So I think that was actually an excellent comment on, on what you're saying. I think there are aspects about this that I think you want to, it's really about bringing people in not excluding people out and, and thinking about what that what you could do to the design to mm -hmm. to make this that was, piece. what 12 years ago when he oh. created this so he he was only 23 or 24 yeah. years old yeah, yeah. Uh, yes um, this past summer actually I, uh, I I used Sam's book to teach out of and the connection that these kids these these teenagers were making for themselves was just unbelievable. And you know, one of the assignments that I gave one student was just to he had an entire day of solo time just to sit with the book. He read the whole thing cover to cover and he then needed to come back to the group and himself teach from Sam's book that night. Just pick one one chapter or one thing that you know really resonated with him. And after that night I had every single student in my group come up to me and ask me for that, assi that same assignment. They all wanted to read the book, and, and they all did. I was, I was out in the field with these kids for two weeks, and they, each one of them had an opportunity to spend a day sitting with Sam's book, and in turn, um, come back to the group and teach and make, make a connection to their own lives from, from Sam's teaching. So there's a lot of, of connection here for me, just in terms of you know, the work that I've been doing the last few years, and I mean, also just as a, as a speech pathologist, I mean, there's a lot of connections, and so when we talk about the bridge from uh, Western medicine to Eastern medicine, and how this becomes integrative, um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, and thank you for sharing, and I, I will definitely be in touch with you. And <laughs> a lot more um, questions for you and, and feedback, so. I welcome that. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for um, talking about Sam's book, Many Blessings, and it is actually on the back table. So if any of you would like to make a donation uh, to this wonderful cause and, and have Sam's book and to use it in many different ways, use it with your students, use it with your loved ones, use it for yourself as a meditation, I think it would be a wonderful thing to take away from this first gift of mind, body, healing through the arts and of Sam Hanser and Suzanne and, and Clark and, and, and all of us who are um, wanting to, to heal the planet. So thank you all for being here. Thank you panelists for your, your brilliance and um, thank you audience for your brilliance. And we'll hope we'll see you next week. <laughs> Most, some of you, not all of you. I wish you could all come back next week. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>